This segment brought to you by Bravo Company USA. First ever LAV live episode. Who'd have thought? <laughs> it's working. Hey, I'm here with my buddy Tyler Gray. How's it going? And uh, this is the official launch of LAV Live. Um, this is something that we were kind of planning on doing on YouTube, and we were thinking about calling it LAV Raw. And but we've decided to use Facebook uh, Live as the venue versus doing it on YouTube and whatnot. Hoping to do this once a week. I can tell you right now, it's kind of an impossible goal. Um, based on the fact that I'm traveling, I've got different things going on, but that's going to be the goal is to try to do it once a week and put out the time and date and whatnot. Um, so everybody knows when we're going to be on or when I'm going to be on and you, you can come online and, and we'll see what we can get done. We're looking to pull up the comments here to answer you guys questions. Bear with us. FN57, personal carry. What's your thoughts? Who's that from? KW Lewis. KW Lewis, FN57. I'll be honest with you, it's a 22 Winchester Magnum. And uh, I've done consulting work, work for FN. They do, they do a great job in a lot of ways, but the FN57, just like the HK MP7, the 4.6, I mean, that's a 17 HMR, and um, FN57 is 22 Win Mag, so I'll be honest, it, is it a self-defense cartridge to me? Absolutely not. It certainly is my buddy Ken Hackathorn would say, it's better than a sharp, sharp stick in the eye, but uh, it's not what I would carry for self-defense. Stephen Persons, what's your favorite carry gun? Both of you guys. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'll start with mine. Uh, my favorite carry gun uh, is Glock 19, uh, kind of a the old standby or the new standby, I guess. But the way I see it, the same argument that is always made uh, for having a gun can actually, that same argument of, well, I'd rather have a gun and need it than not have it. If you take that argument, it applies to, well, if you do need a gun, then you better have the freaking best gun that you can possibly have on you. So while I've bought, uh, you know, shields and 43s, at the end of the day, if it's worth carrying, it's worth carrying something that you can really do something with. That's my opinion, and that's why I carry a 19. Glock 19 is, is hard to beat. It's the right size. It just brings everything to the table. So, yeah, that's, that's the go-to. In my call... My call is the everyday carry gold go to gold standard is the Glock 19, and then you just kind of take it from there. There might be a time and a place where you don't carry one of those. Let's say you don't have the gun on your body, and you're, it's going to be in whatever fanny pack or purse or whatever, and you go, you know, I'm a little bit hinky about having a weapon, you know, like a Glock or whatever, a striker fired gun that doesn't have a manual safety that doesn't ha isn't double action, single action. Then you might want to look at something else. Um, HKP 30 or HKP 2000 is a great choice in there, but man, the Glock 19, I tell you, that's kind of the benchmark and, uh, it is a hard gun to beat. There's a reason why you've seen so many, um, units within the special operations community yeah. carry that gun. Uh, NSW just went to, yep. uh, I mean, it's, again, it's, if you look at the size that the gun is, uh, the amount of rounds, especially the 19 and nine mil, how many rounds you get, 15 uh, plus one. I mean, uh, it, again, it's just, it's really hard to beat. It's at this point now, um, you know, for a long time, there was really no, um, there's no, like now I have to shoot left-handed. So there's really no um, aftermarket parts to, uh, you know, to put on a Glock to make it easier to shoot the left-handed. Uh, obviously I use Larry's, but you know, now the Glock it has entered that space where now there's just something for everyone to personalize it, to adapt to how you shoot your shooting style or whatever you need to uh, uh, improve it for yourself. So I'm going to warn you one thing though, and I see this more and more in classes all the time. Americans are obsessed with modifications, customizing and everything to a fault. 
and they can actually turn a functionally reliable firearm into a gun that's not even good for a range toy. So be careful if you do that with a self-defense firearm. If you want to do that with something you take to the range and shoot competition with or whatever that you're never going to trust your life to, that's cool. But man, you got to be real careful when you do that with carry guns and other and duty guns and other stuff that can get you in big trouble if that stuff doesn't work. Yeah, that's why I personally focus, like if you look at the gun I'm shooting, it's got two P, an Ambi mag release and a, uh, or an extended one, I should say, for use left-handed. Um, and the uh, bullet, I use left-handed bullet for uh, slide release, again, just because shooting left-handed. Other than that, looking at, and a lighter striker, but again, that's Glock factory parts. So, um, yeah, awesome. Next question. What do you guys think about the Glock 26? Matt Cook. Glock 26, you know, I've, I've never been big on that or the 27. I mean, they're just, they're a small, it kind of goes back to what you said. Go, okay. My thing would be, can I not carry a 19? Is it just completely out of the realm of possibility? If it is, and I, hey, okay, that's the next best choice. But if it's you kind of, kind of, my thought process, if you can carry a 27 or a 26, you probably can carry a 19. I absolutely. And if you take a 26, and I've, I've done this, if you take a 26, first of all, if you have any kind of decent sized hands, your pinky is not going to be on a Glock 26 with a Glock 26 Mac. Which now means you got to put an extended mag to put your pinky on it. By that time, your damn near only difference between that and a 19 is about this much a barrel length. Yeah. And I mean, is it making that big of a difference um, for the barrel length that you're sacrificing and the magazine capacity? That being said, what I do have in every once in a while, kind of in the situations that Larry was talking about, now a 43 is a little bit different. And... If you're going to talk about a 26, I don't think 26 makes sense. Where a 43 could is at least now you're looking at a single stack. So now you're splitting not in half, but you're definitely cutting the width of the gun, which you're not doing with the 26. So now in some environment where you're wearing maybe, you know, gym shorts or something like that, and you really need a mm -hmm. slimmer frame, then that makes sense. But a 26, I... I've never carried one. Exactly. Yeah, I was kind of initially down on the on the forty three, and I had some people kind of say, "Hey, wait a minute, you're not looking at it right." And that, they made a strong point: is that there is a time and a place where you have to have a thinner gun, yeah. and you cannot get by with something like a nineteen, and that's where the forty three comes in. And I went, yeah, "You know what? You got a point." So that I'm with I'm with Tyler. It's kind of the nineteen or the forty three, and I just don't see much of a place for the twenty six or the twenty seven in that equation. No, and, and again, I, I think people, you know, 26 was so, so early on before the 43 was probably a, a thought in anyone at Glock's head. So, and, you know, at that point, maybe it made sense to make what was then a subcompact gun. It's not a subcompact gun now. Hey, uh, I'm pulled up my iPhone. We're having a hard time getting the comments on here. Yeah. And we're yeah. a little, you know, you got to remember we're kind of technology. Well, yeah, so. I don't uh, but I pulled up on my phone here. Um, Brian Alexander Sorensen, good question. Hey, Larry, I noticed in some photos that the museum display of Operation Acid Gamut, the guys have modified jungle fatigues. How long were those fielded? When I got to the unit um, in 89, we got them. Everybody liked them. They're super comfortable and all that. I tell you what, it, after the invasion of Panama, we didn't wear them anymore because we had 82nd guys shoot at us. Because we had black body armor on. Protect helmets and whatnot, and they're running around in BDUs. And we had them. I remember they shot at our squadron commander, and he said, "That's it. We never wore them again after Panama." Everybody loved them. They were, they look cool, and they were super comfortable. But the reality is, you need to be in a uniform that friendly forces can identify with. And you got to remember, they're not trained on your level. So a lot of those guys are scared shitless, and they're going to shoot first and ask questions later. And, and that, you know, that, that same thing happened in Iraq, Afghanistan, where, you know, again, special operations forces want to have, kind of want to pick their own uniform uh, or their own, uh, you know, color or pattern, but you get too far away from something that's the norm. And then it looks just like, you know, um, the enemy at this point doesn't give a shit about uniforms. They'll wear, you know, exactly. anything. So 
anything that's not an obvious U.S. military or an obvious uh, NATO ally that you're working with uniform, hey, uh, you know, the, the, the rule of, in war is, you know, t I'm not saying it's a good rule, but it happens. Hey, I'd rather shoot first and be wrong than uh, not. And uh, I, not I'm with you. To be yeah. wrong. I, I think that every, all the services getting their own camo and own uniforms, they kind of went too far out in the weeds on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not. It's, I, it's coming back now, I think. Good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Richard M. Stafford, how's it going? LAV, what are your thoughts on having selective military personnel being armed stateside and both the active and reserve sides? I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I think it's a great idea to have military personnel over here, especially recruiting stations, on base, any place oh, yeah. where they're a profile, they're, they're a high vis target having them armed. I'm 100% for it. I've always thought they should have done it. it, it and, and on that note, it's a, uh, a mind boggling thing where, thing where you think of this logic and I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's okay. You're, you're okay to have, you know, machine guns in a war zone, we trust you there, but we don't trust you to have them here. That's too dangerous. Uh, yeah, that that's a contradiction. It makes absolutely no sense. I'm I'm all for it. Got it. The battlefield has changed. It things have changed now, and we know that. And you, you, I'm preaching to the choir, certainly to Tyler, and I know the majority of you guys watching this. Things have changed, and people need to adapt and need to understand our military personnel are a target, whether they're here or overseas, and we have to give them the tools to protect themselves. If we don't do that. We we're doing them wrong. On that note, if you and this is something we'll talk about with with one of the things we're going to talk about uh, coming up, kind of an announcement. But one of the things the enemy has done, um, you know, everything on the battlefield is an adaptation. It's a chess game, and the enemy has learned obviously that they can't go head to head. And so, what do they got to do? They got to move their chess pieces in different ways that are unexpected. So what they've done is since they can't go head to head on the battlefield, they've taken the battlefield here. It's, it's, not, it's an obvious next move and we have to now adjust our chessboard and adjust the way that we treat the, treat the moves, treat the players, and more importantly, how we treat the game. On that note, we, we're going to answer some more questions, but we've got an important announcement coming up. Uh, with Tyler that you guys are going to dig, which dovetails right into what he was just talking about. All right. Okay. Let's get more, a couple more questions here. Jacob Babbins, you can have one BCM rifle for the rest of your life. Which one are you taking? I'll be honest with you, the one I've got now. It's a lightweight setup. What, what barrel length? 14 and a half. It, it's pent. It has a, it has a um, combination muzzle, di muzzle device flash suppressor permanently attached. If I was going to run a suppressor, I thought that was a factor. I would factor that in and get, um, you know, I would change that equation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's lighter weight barrel profile. I've shot the gun. It easily shoots under two minutes of angle with quality ammo. No problem at all. And you can put a variety of optics on it and you're ready to go. So I, it, I that's the gun I'd use. That's why if you guys notice, my primary Bravo Company training gun has been largely unchanged now for probably three years. Um, I've added different Bravo company accessories to it as they come online, buttstock, pistol grip, you know, the KMR rail and all that kind of stuff. But the, the basic platform, the barrel, the gun itself has largely main, you know, remained unchanged. And there's a reason for it. It has to be the best set up carbine that I've ever personally used. I mean, in the military, you have an iron laser requirement in civilian and whatnot. That's really not much of a requirement, but White light, red dot, of course, aim point. My sling from Blue Force Gear. Dude, I'm, yeah, I know you probably get bored looking at pictures of it on Facebook, but it, it's a great gun. I mean, I, I really, really like it. All right, cool. So there, let's see here. We're going to talk about Sentinel here coming up, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Best sights for the 19. I have sights with Wilson Combat, of course. What a shocker. But here's, here's what I'll tell you. Whether you use my rear sight or somebody else's, find a front sight that you can see and that works for you and that you can see in the variety of conditions you expect to use it. If it's going to be mainly a range toy, man, fiber optics 
are hard to beat. I was using it at the range today. That that was mean, fiber optics. Now, they're useless at night, so you got to factor that in. I've been using the Trijicon HD I, front. The, that thing is it, a beast. I use yellow-green, personally. I, I the, you had the orange-red, red which orange. is cool, but I use the yellow-green. The only thing I'll ding on them for is they're a little on the fat side. I would prefer if they were just a little thinner, but they're my, they're my favorite fronts, and I use the Vickers Elite Wilson Combat Rear. Man, they're, I love the sights. Uh, I'm the same way, and specifically, though, a lot of people shoot them in the daytime and kind of they don't really understand that those things, excuse the pun here, but they really shine at night. You go in low light conditions, and that thing just pops. Okay, Colby Bazell, thank you, gentlemen. What's your opinion of the Beretta ARX? I've got a semi auto one. Yeah, we, yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to really take it out and shake it out. I mean, I've been busy between videos, training classes, other industry commitments. Actually, taking the thing out and shaking it out and really sorting it out is, is tough. And so, I'm going to have to table that for now until I get a chance to go out and really shoot the gun. I certainly do not want to pass judgment on it without having put any rounds downrange because I've learned from experience you can't do that. I've seen guns go both ways. I've seen guns that you handle and you go, man, this thing's going to be a winner. And then you go out and shoot it and you're like, whoa, man, they missed the boat here. Or I've seen guns go the other way. You handle it and you go, ah, it's going to be kind of a dog. And then you shoot it and you go, whoa, this thing is awesome. It's a pussycat. So I'm going to table the ARX right now till we get a chance to shoot it. And, and Larry brings up a good point too where especially, I mean, this happens in every industry, but I see a lot in the gun industry or, or gear or whatever, and people will give an opinion, and then I'll go, well, this thing sucks. And I'll go, well, look, I mean, how many rounds have you shot through it? Well, I've never shot it. You know. And you just kind of, well, then your opinion means nothing. If, if, don't, if, you shouldn't have an opinion on a piece of gear that you haven't personally tried. Exactly. You yeah. need to at least go shoot it and try it. You, trust me, there'll be a lot of guns out there that you go, ooh, this is not nearly as bad as I thought. Hey, Skylar McLaren, you posted a CZ-75 today, first model. We did a video on it, by the way. It's going to be on our Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. How do you feel about those pistols? CZs are good guns. I'm a big fan of the older guns, the older CZs, the ones that were made prior to the Warsaw Pact collapsing. Those were dynamite guns. And that first model I did the video on is dynamite. That thing is, of course, rare collector's item, but... The quality of the CZ pistols were at, was at their peak at that time. That's, they're cool guns. I like CZ guns. Maybe yeah. someday, if I can sweet talk them, I can take me and the crew over and we can film at the factory in the Czech Republic. CZ, we're looking at you. All right. Do, 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 do. See all through here. Talk about this one, actually. Interesting. Somebody said uh, chest rigger battle, battle belt. belt and Evan, Evan and Haley line. Jr., chest rigger battle belt. So, you know, I was uh, obviously coming from the background that we came from. Obviously, I was always chest rig, chest rig, chest rig. Um, and the battle belt, when it first came out, I just, I looked at it and I went, that's just too much crap on my belt. I, I was against it. Um and again, it's one of those things where I was against, my gut feeling was against it, but then I had to go with uh, what I always say, which is, hey, don't have an opinion until you try it out. So then I ran a battle belt. And again, whether you're talking about guns or gear, everyone needs to look at one thing, just like Larry was talking about with the sights. At the end of the day, or really at the beginning of the day, before all this selection and decisions happen, you got to look at what your end state is. What is it going to be used for? And then you work backwards from there. Meaning, you know, if like I have a battle belt set up, if I'm going to the range to instruct, I don't want to wear a big old heavy vest, but I'm going to be doing reloads. I'm going to be uh, from a pistol. I'm going to be doing reloads for, from a rifle. So I need to have a couple mags on me. I don't want to put them on my chest. I don't want to wear my armor when I'm instructing. For me now... I love of having a battle belt for that because it gives me everything I need on my belt without having to wear, you know, a plate and balance the armor or whatever, or put the mags on my chest. So again, what is your ultimate in state? What's your purpose? Mm -hmm. 
and then pick your gear from there. Yeah, what are you gonna do with it? And I'll tell you, here's the great thing. Post 9-11, we have had a gear avalanche. There is more good gear now after 9-11 than we could have ever dreamed. Not even comparable. Uh, you got more quality companies. You got guys in the cutting edge. Blue Force Gear makes my sling. They're always pushing the cutting edge for you know very lightweight. Yeah. You got guys rock solid. First Spear is a good company. You know some of the old Eagle guys put that together. You just got a lot of really good gear companies. It's it's now got to be careful if you buy cheap you're going to buy twice so you got to spend real money and get the gear my suggestion is do your homework and figure out what's going to work best for you before you spend the money absolutely absolutely hey uh i got one back here it's being asked about aztec training let me see where it's at Yeah. Jerry Devon, what's the word with Aztec training services? Saw things going sour with Alias. Talked to some friends of mine. Number one, my buddy Chen Lee, SMG Lee right there. Chen yeah. Lee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and his buddy Andrew Ho. And they were looking at, at one point, actually trying to take over Alias. And they, they dug into the weeds on that. And they found out that it was a no-go, that it, basically things were too far gone. And I said, you know what, as, as my situation has developed, my business sense, my status and whatnot, I realized I, I have to be more involved. I have to be in, more in control. I have to be a partner. I can't really kind of be a quote unquote employee. I'm past that. And um, so I said, how about us three? We get together and we start our own uh, training company for lack of a better term i'll be you know one of the instructors but i'm also one of the owners and we're basically taking what we know works which is number one customer service i mean doing what you say you're going to do doing right by the customer standing by your word i mean just really kind of following through dotting the i's and crossing the t's and um to their credit both chen and andrew did a great job they burnt the midnight oil and they stood up the website in less than 72 hours and that's why we were ready to launch uh, when that whole thing collapsed on Alias. And I made a decision right from the start. I was going to honor all the deposits and the commitments that I had to my students. I mean, <clears throat> I've got too many irons in the fire to hang guys out to dry. That's, right. that's not the way I am. Yeah. So, Again, taking care of your customers, as you exactly. said, rule number one. Bingo. So we've got it going. I'm on board. Daryl Holland's on board. Daryl's a great guy. Good great, dude. Great. I was in with, bat, in, with in, him. Yeah, in the well. unit. Yeah. And uh, my buddy, Ken Hackathorn, who's quasi-retired, but because he's good friends of all of ours, he decided to came on, come on board with Aztec and to kind of show his support. And then we'll definitely be adding other guys, but the, right now that's the, the three, and we're slowly but surely tr you know, transferring everything over and getting everything on track. If you have any questions, you guys can always email me, um, you know, Larry at VickersTactical.com. You know, I'll answer any questions you have on Aztec or whatever. <clears throat> All right, here we go. A few more questions, and then we'll get on to some big announcements. Hey, here's one. Frank Sofranic. So Sofranic, yeah. yeah. Thoughts on the FBI going to 9 mil? Bam. I've been a 9 mil guy for a while, and I, I know I, you I, have I, too. I've <clears throat> said it for, we both said it for a long time. There's, there are modern 9mm hollow points on the market that are very lethal. And, and you kind of go, wait a minute, what am I carrying a 40 for? You know, I mean, the guns are harder to shoot. They carry less bullets. They beat you up more. They don't, they don't last. It, it, I'm all for it. Here's another critical point that people, people really don't think of this when they factor in their caliber selection. And that is, what is making you more lethal? Um, or I shouldn't say lethal, but well, actually we're talking about stopping power. So here's what it comes down to. What's going to make you better. What's going to make you better is hitting the target. What's going to make you better at hitting the target is more training. So the nine mil is going to be considerably cheaper than let's say 45, giving you a lot more rounds to put down range for you to get better at hitting the target. And as Larry said a million times, the worst hit 
is much more devastating than you know a miss. So at the end of the day, the nine mil is a great value. It allows you to get a lot of training, mm -hmm. and in modern ammunition, it is absolutely just as lethal of a caliber as anything on the market. Yeah, it's, I'm, I've been a nine mil guy for a while. Same, same thing. With myself. It's interesting. Bill Wilson, Wilson Combat fame sent around an email to a bunch of guys in the industry. This goes back maybe a year. And me, <clears throat> Rob Latham, Ken Hackathorn, a ton of people were on the email list. Okay, and he had some criteria. You know, what caliber, if you could only have one handgun caliber, what caliber would you pick? Yada, 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 right down the line. Every single person on the list with the exception of one picked nine mil, every single one. I mean, we live in a nine, world, nine mil world now. And there's really good hollow point self-defense loads on the market that are very effective. So, yeah, I've been a 9 mil guy for a while now. I know you have. Yeah, we, we actually had that argument with other people 10 years ago. Hey, here we go. Fletch Schubert. First of all, Fletch, your parents are awesome because I assume where your name came from. There you go. Classic. What happened to the Sentinel show? Okay, time to address it. So, uh, Sentinel... Um, we have an unbelievable presenting sponsor, uh, which is CCW Safe. Um, if you don't know about CCW Safe, uh, a lot of people have asked, we've seen a ton of questions about concealed carry, EDC, things like that. Um, if you haven't heard of CCW Safe, what they do is it's former police officers uh, that then became lawyers, and they realize concealed carrying now as civilians that. You know, if I got into a shooting, man, I had some pretty good protection when I was in law enforcement. Yeah, now I'm a civilian. I, I don't have it. Yeah, I could get sued and, and you know, uh, they, they realized obviously the liability now is as attorneys. So they created CCW Safe, which provides uh, insurance that you can purchase that will protect you in case you get into a shooting. Um, and it's... A, in my opinion, a ridiculous value. Oh, and for it, the money, yeah. For the it's money, steal. it's ridiculous. And, but the thing is here is I look at that type of insurance in the same way that I look at carrying a gun to begin with. If you're going to carry a gun, concealed carry to begin with, then the only real point in carrying a gun is you have to have the opinion that at some point you may possibly mm -hmm. use it. Yeah. If not, what's the point of carrying? Exactly. It? So then if you take it that step, then you got to go another step further. Whether you are the most in the most justified shooting of all time, we live in a litigious society, you're probably going to get sued. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. It's just going to happen. It's a sad reality of the world we live in today. Um, and having protection in the case of, again, whether it's a justified or non-justified shooting, has nothing to do with your civil liability or your potential to be civilly sued. Yeah. So um, that's what CCW Safe does. They're the presenting sponsor. We're the presenting sponsor of the Sentinel. The Sentinel has been rebranded um, and we're very excited about the direction it's going, which is kind of what we talked about earlier uh, or, or what I talked about earlier with kind of the war, the, the enemy um, changing the battlefield mm -hmm. from being overseas to now at home. Um, and again, it's, it's a sad reality. We've seen it, especially in the last six months over and over again. And, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but we know the direction it's going to go. Things are going to happen like this more, not less. And the new show will be called The Gray Man. Based on, uh, or the concept being, and I know The Gray Man is kind of a, it's a term you hear uh, a lot in the tactical space. The problem is, is it doesn't really mean what people think it means. And by that, I mean, the gray man isn't, so we used to have a term which would be low visibility, low vis operations. A low vis operation, if I'm running around, if you look at, you know, Blackwater guys in civilian clothes with 5.11s and M4s, is that low visibility? Mm. No. They fly. A lot. It, you're, you're completely obvious to who you are. So in reality, there's no such, there's low signature, but low visibility doesn't mean anything. Same thing with the gray man. If I'm running around with 5'11 pants on, I may be, and again, I'm not, you know, jumping all over 5'11, but I'm saying if I'm wearing the attire, you know, I got a shirt that says kill terrorist on it, all right, and I've got everything running around, maybe I'm concealed carrying, but everyone can look at me and go, 
that guy's probably carrying concealed. Bingo. And the point of the gray man is if you really want to be able to affect and stop situations or have the, have the ability, the training, and the knowledge to help in those situations, then one of the first things you have to do is learn how to truly be able to help, have those skills, have the confidence, and also fit right into that crowd and blend in to where an attacker doesn't obviously know that you are a potential defender. Mm -hmm. To take it one step further, you constantly really hear nowadays the whole uh, sheep, wolf, and sheep talk. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. And the reason I don't agree with that is because at the end of the day, Larry, do you view yourself as a sheepdog? Yeah, well, no. I mean, no. so I'm going to throw out the term gray wolf. Okay? Because we're not sheepdogs, we're wolves. And the difference between that is at the end of the day, a predator is a predator. And it's all how we, you know, how we decide to defend others that makes us good or bad. And what you're looking at with this upcoming program is, is Tyler is going to kind of take the lead. I'll be helping and others. Yeah, absolutely. But he's going to be kind of taking the lead, hence the name Gray Man. CCW Safe's presenting it. And it, basically it's designed to make you think out of the box and, and make you kind of think what if. That's, that's exactly the point. And, yeah. and going back to everything I'm talking about, it's all about taking what we conventionally know and what everything's kind of been told to us, including the term being the gray man and really thinking about it in a different way, um, really taking everything, breaking it down to logical step-by-step -step and really looking at it in a way that people can learn and apply it in the real world. Bingo. So that's one of the big announcements tonight. Obviously, the LAV Live was the biggie from my perspective and, uh, and obviously Gray Man 2, which is Tyler's main effort. I'll be assisting. Um, those are the two big announcements. Um, CCW safe. God bless them. There's some really good informational videos, some stuff where I've interviewed some of the CCW safe guys. I'm proud to be a brand ambassador. I, they, I remember when they called me and uh, we got to talk and I said, dude, I'm sold. I was five minutes into the conversation. I'm sold. Some of the guys on there are some of the sharpest guys I've ever met in the firearms industry. Yeah. Um, they're really good guys and they have really got a good head on their shoulders. So I highly recommend CCW safe. Very proud to be affiliated with them. Yeah. Same. No regrets at all. And again, it's one of those things where it's easy to go, well, I'm just going to practice shooting and I'm never going to think of the legal aspect. Talk to anyone who has been in a yeah, civilian man, shooting a plan. and they will tell you that's not a good idea. Um, Okay, Tom Azito, recommended holster company. I, I use Raven. I have used Raven concealment systems for years now. I'm a big believer. When I find something that works, I stick with it. And I've used Raven for a long time. Um, I know there's a lot of good holster companies. So, but that's that's what I use. If you see me come to a class, I mean, that's that's what I'm using. They have a LAV signature line. They've got also a line from my buddy Ken Hackathorn. Um, but check them out. They make a wide variety of holsters. Um, if you have any doubt, buy the Phantom because it's kind of the yeah, general pretty, purpose yeah. holster they make. If you if there's any doubt in your mind, like, I'm not much sure what I should buy, just buy a Phantom and drive one. Yeah. Really good fit on those holsters. All right, let's see what we got here. Hey, thanks for watching the Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. To subscribe, click here. And to watch some of my favorite videos, click here. Have a good one. LAV out.